Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so this morning is a, uh, it's a new experiment. Well, an experiment is new, right? <laughs> With Matthias and I. So we're going to present to you a bunch of cases where the medical side of it didn't really lead to what the cause was. And so he and I, we sit on the same floor and our teams engage with each other all the time. And what happens is that we get all these medical symptoms, diagnoses, and they try to treat, but they're not always sure what the real cause was. So it's kind of like a, guess, a guessing game. And so the engineering side gets in and we do the analysis and we can come down really to the root cause. And from that, we can then try to effect change back into the industry. So that's, that's really how we learn from these lessons that start off as medicine. Yeah, for us it's really, it, it, it really works well. For a good number of years, we were always trying to put things together the best we could and, and many times beyond our training as medical people. But with, with the risk mitigation team that we have had for what, three, four years now? Yeah. Where we, like Francois said, coexist in the same floor, it's really fluid how we literally walk into each other's office and say, hey, I just got this call, this is the, the scenario, can you help us put this together? Do you have any idea what might have been happening behind the scenes, right? Okay, so in order to understand these accidents, clearly we need to get the symptoms and ultimately the diagnosis from medicine. That triggers us into seeing well, what could perhaps be the cause. And then and I'm an engineer, my background and my training is in engineering. And we then have a look at obviously taking what we get from medicine and we then start to analyze it from a technical point of view. But it's really together that we then come up with what the solution is. And, and quite often it's the, the patient that really wants to know what caused this so that they can avoid it from happening again in the future. And we're going to present some interesting cases to you. These aren't regular kind of, you know, DCS type cases. Okay, and ultimately the idea with this is to make change, which is not always that easy because it's really affecting human behavior. And in most cases there's been some human engagement. But often what happens, it's not the diver that actually started the chain of events. It was, you know, the dive operator or the people filling the compressor or some other reason. And that's kind of what we get down to analyzing. So you have to really get down to what we call the root cause analysis and understand where this started from. That helps us in the process. And then we start, you know, talking to the, to the, to the sometimes to the victim or the patient. Sometimes we then uh, get a chance to speak to the dive operator, the boat owner, depending on where it happens to be. And quite often they don't want to speak to us. <laughs> they kind of think that there's you know, some liability coming in. And I can tell you right from the outset, we do not share any of this information with anybody. Yeah, in theory it could be discoverable, but they really are not going to know what it is that we're doing. And we keep everything as anonymous as possible. Because we are sensitive to the fact that some people will take, uh, take, take advantage of the situation to try and get the benefit out of some lawsuit. Ultimately, it's human behavior that causes these things, and that's really where we extract everything and then feed that back as best we can. People don't always want to listen to what we have to say, but hey, you've got to start somewhere. Okay, in terms of disclosure, let's just kind of set the scene here um, if we can. So when you have an accident, you are, <clears throat> sometimes you get first-hand accounts, <clears throat> but if the person has been injured, it's pretty difficult to get the first-hand account. So we get witnesses' statements and then third party and then what they remember afterwards. And when we engage with them, question and answer, we're kind of getting information that's even older than that. In this particular case, we go, we've adjusted some of the scenarios to make them easier to transfer to you. They're not always as black and white as what we will present now, but we have, through time, managed to come down to what the real issues were. Clearly, we're going to be, keep confidentiality, so we're going to be very generic in terms of where these happened. Um, but we'll tell you when, and some of you are probably smart enough to track back, you might have heard of something. Some of them are pretty old, and we're only now getting to getting the information, because <laughs> very often in an accident, because of liability issues, everybody shuts up. And for us to try and dig out the information is sometimes not that easy. And then obviously we're not going to reveal any personal information. So now and again, Matthias and I might slip into he, she, it's not intentional. It's meant to be the patient or the dive operator, whoever else it is. And also keep in mind that when we, when we refer to these cases, you know, the, the interaction that we, we talked before, that doesn't always happen on the first interaction, right? The call may have come in on the emergency line, 
and that's not the time to look for root cause. We try to address what is going on and steer the case to the right place. And then with subsequent follow-ups and as we get more information and once the case cools down, then we can do, okay, what exactly happened here? And that's when we sometimes have these interactions. But so don't expect that is, if you call the hotline, we're gonna give you, we, we don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> So let's go jump into this first case. So this happened on a remote island in the tropical Pacific. And so this was a 62-year-old female on leave aboard. And after seven days of diving, she noticed a fine powder on the first stage. Uh, so she contacted the dive master and the dive master thought, well, this could be aluminum oxide, so no big deal. And so he wiped it off, he took a toothbrush, uh, brushed the, the, the first stage, and they continued diving. So two days later, the lady come back, comes back and she says, well, this, this white powder is, is again on my, on my uh, first stage. And so another dive master did the same thing, right? just cleaned it and continued, but in this case, uh, he also replaced the, the tank. So on the next day, the diver says that she noticed some uh, changes. So she had no voice, and her airways, uh, she said, my airways kind of burned when I took a deep breath. So she was concerned. Thankfully, there were two doctors on board, on this liver board, and they examined her, they couldn't find anything, and they said, well, maybe this is just, just developing a cold. Let's just let it run its course. Uh, but the diver later on, she said that looking retrospectively, it did not feel like, a, like an actual cold. So once she was at home, uh, she developed an eye and an ear infection, and she said that she could barely talk. So the way we can explain this is, you know, if you have this white powder, if she actually inhaled this, our airways will react in, a, in, in almost a predictable way, right? You have some foreign body, you have, our airways are full of immune cells, and when we get a foreign body, the cells will try to encapsulate it, wall it off, and cause an inflammatory reaction. The airways are all the same, all up to our ears with the eustachian tubes. So when there is an inflammatory process, the, the eustachian tubes will react or may react in the same way, and that's why she had this eye and ear irritation. This is educated guess, but it kind of makes sense. Again, looking at it retrospectively. Keep in mind, it's always easy to connect the dots backwards. Um, so then when she developed this eye and ear infection, she said, well, maybe this, this was a cold. Uh, so she was put on antibiotics and she somehow improved, but she continued having this, this cough. After two days of antibiotics, she felt that her lungs were um, uh, worse than ever. And a different doctor, she said that well, maybe she's having an asthma attack, and she did have a past medical history of asthma, but she didn't have any episodes in 28 years. Um, despite being you know, active, physically active, and, and, and exercising regularly. So she thought, well, yes, I do have this, but it didn't really make any sense. So after a seven day course of corticosteroids and an and inhaler, then eventually that's when she said, this is, there's something wrong here, let's, let's call that. Okay, so they did notice white powder on the inlet of the first stage, so that kind of is a clue that it's coming obviously from the cylinders, unlikely to be lying around. And on the liverboard, they're obviously changing cylinders frequently, and the white powder came back, so that indicates probably a very widespread problem with those cylinders. The trick, though, that we only found out afterwards was that there was also fine white powder on the inside of the demand valve. So that's now telling you that the powder is getting from the inlet to the first stage all the way through to, to the demand valve, which is pretty rare. We don't see that very often and should be a good warning sign to people that something is not right here. So the inlet filters are going to remove a lot of what we call the white powder, the larger particles of white powder that you like to, to get. So those above five microns. And that's an estimation because it's really tough to get the manufacturers to tell you what the filters are capable of removing. Some of them will tell you 15, some of them tell you one micron, but the average that I've managed to find out is about five microns. And this is a magic number. I mean, obviously there's a fair, fairly broad spectrum of, of particle size. But above five microns tends to cause upper respiratory tract issues, and below five microns are what causes the lung issues. 
So what we could deem or determine out of that was that it was the particles going into the lungs that caused this chemical pneumonia, if you want to actually call it, call it that. Yeah. Okay, and, and the lungs do get rid of the powder eventually, but it causes an inflammation to start with, and that's the clue there was the antibiotics and the inhalers and those things were not really resolving the issues. And seven days later, you'd expect the body to have rejected them if they had been larger particles. The smaller particles tend to stay behind. Just something I thought to add into this, um, because it was a question that she actually um, inquired about, and other people inquired about. So we have aluminium, and you'll hear Dr. Nochet and I talk about aluminium. <laughs> We're not really from here, right? Aluminium. Um, that, that the oxide of aluminium is actually toxic and carcinogenic. And that's anecdotal. I've spent many years of my life working in a um, manufacturing outfit. We were using aluminium all the time. And I had staff members that ended up with Alzheimer's and things, I mean, not many of them, claiming that it came from working with aluminium. But the studies show that the frequency is almost irrelevant, measuring the number of people that work in these factories versus the number that come out. So we don't believe that that is a cause of anything. It's more going to be the inflammation due to the particles that are going in. And just one other thing to mention, and sometimes we don't realize this, it's not the partial pressure that we're concerned about because particles don't have a partial pressure. But when we dive, we're obviously breathing in denser gas, which means the particle loading is increasing. We're breathing in more particles. When you look at the EPA's um, what air quality index, which is kind of a combination between 2.5 micron particles and 10 micron particles, that's fine. Those concentrations, you know, you're unlikely to really react to when it comes out of a cylinder. But when you dive down to, you know, 100 feet, you've now multiplied that by three. So you're getting three times the number of particles. And that was kind of quite a clue in figuring this thing out. Just to go back to, to the, the size of those particles, if you remember, that she started developing this cough, right? And we know that if the particle is larger than uh, five microns, it usually affects the upper respiratory tract. So when these particles get into the tract, Again, those white blood cells that we have on the, all in the, in the epithelium, they start attacking them. They start trying to, you know, encapsulate these particles. And then with the irritation, we produce mucus, right? Then these cells, they have cilia. They have like hairs that they try to pull all the things upwards. And we pull them upwards until the moment they reach our throat. And that's when we either cough them off or we swallow them and go into the digestive system and we get rid of them. So that explains the coughing she had early on, but she also had lung irritation that persisted longer. So there's a chance that the particles were even smaller and started affecting the lungs. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we went back here, Matthias. I was trying to give you. Yeah, clue. just. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how to jump faster than that. You know your your apple. I'm not an apple aficionado, so that's his his game. Okay, so the cause clearly is oxidation of these aluminium cylinders. The, perhaps the worrying side of it was that they were picking up clearly visible signs of powder, which means those cylinders probably hadn't been hydrated and cleaned in quite a while, because within your hydro testing phase, your, certainly your inspection phase, annual inspection, you'd pick up because you'd see it. I mean, obviously it forms and you don't see it when it starts. Then it has to break off. And then it has to be entrained to come up the dip tube. So it's not an automatic thing. And it's you know, quite rare to actually see these things coming out, unless there's been no maintenance on the cylinders. So to prevent this, you need, obviously, to do regular inspection, both of your cylinder as well as of your first stage. Because a clogged first stage, and her first stage was totally clogged, which either indicated that previously there'd been issues, and certainly indicated that that regulator hadn't been serviced in quite a while. And as I said, they will catch the five micron particles. And five microns are small, so it still looks like a kind of like a powder. But the smaller ones obviously go straight through. And that was what was lodging on her, um, on a demand valve. Let me just go back one. Sorry. How do you go back one <laughs> thing, Matthias? I think it's this. No? Nope. Yeah. Yeah, but I've got to go to the next series of slides. Oh. OK. Oh, never mind. We'll just keep going. Okay, so the oxidation clearly is caused by um, water reacting with the aluminium. Now, aluminium is a very stable metal underwater, even when you have seawater on it. It tends to last a long time before it starts to go, go white. 
When we compress gas with the correct filters, the air should be very dry. So you should not be getting aluminum oxide forming very easily on the inside of the cylinder. So that's also kind of a, a discussion that we needed to have with the, the dive operator, but we didn't get very much luck um, coming out of that. And I think I'm still on the same one. There we go. Okay, so the clues were there, and we got her to eventually send her stuff in to be checked, and I inquired with other service centers as to how frequently this happens, and it happens frequently. I wasn't real, didn't realize that it was actually quite a frequent occurrence. And then you trace back, and these folks are not having the equipment serviced, so it's kind of a very easy warning sign um, that's out there that we should pay attention to. So in this particular case, Medicine dealt with the issue, and because it wasn't, wasn't resolving, the medic came to me and said, listen, you know, what do I think with this? And eventually the patient resolved. They obviously removed all the particles, but that's when I started to dig in, tried to contact the dive operator, certainly spoke to the patient, and we could then unravel this thing. Very interesting case. Yeah, so bottom line is, if, if you ever see this, don't underestimate it. I mean, you, we should demand the operator, and, and we as operators, we should be cognizant that this could be an issue, right? No, there, was, there were no other reports. But remember, we don't always get the reports. And if somebody else had had the fine powder and went home, then we wouldn't most likely have heard of that. They, you know, and of course, it presents like a cough and an irritation to start with. They might have just assumed it was a cold. Was there another question over there? Yeah, the tanks, the tanks need, well, the, it actually goes back to the compressors. It's only going to get the corrosion if you've got moisture in there, and compressors should remove. I mean, if you look at the, the dew point that comes out of, you know, these filter systems, you shouldn't be sure. It's very, very low levels. You know, 25 milligrams per cubic meter or about 45 parts per million, which is very, very, very dry. That's why our throats dry out, uh, dry out when we go diving. And Francois, would you think that eventually the five micron particle filter, could that be clogged by, by this powder and eventually compromise flow? Yep, it does. It actually starves the flow. You know, it gets really, really drastic. Yeah. And the um, service center that I spoke to, he, he does lots of the servicing. And he says that's usually why they bring the regulators in. They say they're really struggling to get the airflow and they've adjusted the valve on the cylinder. And then he, he knows. <laughs> and he sent me some of the pictures to show me how and of course, the deeper you go, you would expect to have more resistance because yeah. of the gas density. Yeah. I would expect it to be worse with a steel tank because steel will corrode a lot quicker than aluminium will. Say again? It would not be aluminium oxide. Right. No, it would, it would be, be just hydrogen oxide. Ferrous oxide, correct. And how, what's the difference between the effects of one or the other? No, they're both, they're both relatively non-toxic. I mean, they cause a reaction, but they're not toxic, and one would expect the same sort of uh, reaction. Yeah. Yes, there is. There, there have been a lot of studies, mostly done under OSHA or NIOSH, the people that actually study the occupational part of right. this, and where I come from, We've seen studies on this too, and they, you know, because we had this complaint that now maybe um, people working with aluminium in, in workshops must wear respiratory protection, um, but they, it was completely inconclusive. It was just kind of anecdotal that one person, you know, had some, some form of lung issue, which you could have had anyway. You know, you always have to bring in that, that percentage factor. Okay. We don't know if, if, they, if she got x-rayed, yeah. So another case. So this was in the Midwest, about 2020. So there was a report of a diver surfacing and response from a very shallow dive and a very short exposure. And apparently one of the dive bodies, uh, the witness that the diver apparently seized underwater. So this was a 40-year-old male with a past medical history of being an, an alcoholic in recovery. And so when EMS got to the scene, they performed CPR, the saturation was 70%, and eventually the diver regained alertness. So at the hospital, they do a CT scan, and they find that he had a stroke, and he had uh, infiltrates in his upper lobe. You can see there, you may not know what you're looking for, but if you 
look for symmetry, right and left, you will see in the upper right quadrant this density different than, than what you see on the right. So that, that's a stroke. And then on the lungs, again, you see on the upper uh, uh, lobe this uh, hyperintensive images, that's, that's an infiltrate. We don't know if that's infection, we don't know exactly what that is. All we can say is that's a condensed lung full of, of liquid. So, well, this could be the result of a, of a hypoxic uh, insult, right? But was this uh, hypoxic insult the cause of what, why the diver seized, or was it a consequence of why the diver seized? So, this was a landlocked hospital. They knew that this was a diver, and they said, well, listen, we don't see these cases very often, and they called them because, well, should we, should we call a chamber? Should we send this patient to a chamber? What do you think? So we don't know what happened, right? But when somebody surfaces unresponsive, one of the things we have to consider is potentially a stroke. Uh, sorry, a stroke, an AGE, well, similar to a stroke. So we couldn't rule out an AGE, and we said, yeah, I mean, when in doubt, it's better to treat. Uh, if it was not an AGE, well, you're likely not going to cause any further damage. And if it was an AGE, we treated it very early on. Just thinking of what you're saying now, so if, if they had a seizure, quite often they'll hold their breath. Right. And you'll end up then with a greater chance of having the AGE. And with 26 feet of seawater, if you're holding your breath, you have more than enough delta P to cause a pulmonary valve trauma, right? Okay, so interesting out of this one, a couple of months later, about two months later, he calls Dan, he now wants to know what actually happened here. He, you know, for him it was, I think he some, perhaps denied some of his underlying history, but he really wanted to figure out, and he had a couple of clues that he was uh, mentioning. So I asked him, because now I want to look at the gas and see maybe there's something in the gas that isn't correct. And he'd kept both the cylinder he was diving with as well as the second cylinder that he was going to use for his um, second dive. Fortunately, and one was yellow and one was blue, so we could kind of identify which one was which. And he said, you know, I had this really bitter, sharp taste in the air that I was breathing. I mean, why do you dive when you actually taste something in the air? He tell you the standards are zero. No odor. I mean, some of us are used to a little bit of kind of a moldy smell, which is pretty common. That's coming from your equipment. That's not coming from the gas. The gas should have absolutely no odor at all. So I got him to send the cylinders for analysis. And Dan has a program where we encourage people to have these things analyzed. And in some cases, if they don't have the funds, we will then um, actually pay for the analysis. And it's like 50 bucks. It's really not a, a large amount of money. And of course, it failed. Okay. No big surprise there. And if you look at how it failed, look at the carbon monoxide levels. Does anybody here know what an acceptable level of carbon monoxide is in our breathing gas? Not that. <laughs> it's, it's 10 parts per million. The actual acceptable limit of carbon monoxide is zero. Why I say that? Because if there is trace amounts of carbon monoxide, it's somewhere there and it could easily magnify to become an unacceptable uh, level. So you can see they're 500 parts per million. And don't forget about the surface equivalent value. So now you have to multiply that by 1.8. So those figures are not just 500, but 500, almost 1,000 parts per million. This is an interesting case, and I hope we have time to get to the very last one, where you'll see the extremes of how the human reacts with carbon monoxide. OK, so what caused this? It was pretty tough <laughs> to go back, but eventually I managed to get hold of the station where it was filled. And some of the clues they gave me, then I spoke to a specialist with compressors just to make sure that I was on the right track. But what they had done is the compressor was in an area where motor vehicles were, so very diligently they took the intake and extended it with a plastic hose, not even a reinforced hose, but a plastic hose, and the diameter was undersized. So we have engineering calculations which mean that for every three feet you need to increase the diameter by a quarter of an inch. So normally we just come in with a four or six inch hose. In this case, it was about 1.5 inches, which is completely um, unrealistic. So too much suction, too much heat, wrong material, and the hose actually then collapsed. And when it collapses, the compressors are now starved. They're still moving as they would normally move. They create a big suction, and the compressor overheats. And when the compressor overheats, it burns the oil. And when we burn the oil, it's what you call incomplete combustion. We produce carbon monoxide. And it's a known, it's a known killer. 
Um, we've had cases around the world, and when we analyze what the problem is, it comes down to burning oil inside the compressor. Not always easy to see, but if you take the oil out afterwards, you'll see it's almost black, indicating that it's burned. Okay, so what we really need to do here is to convince dive operators that unless they know exactly what they're doing, if they're going to make any changes to their compressor after installation, they need to get professional folks in to guide them and explain to them how they actually do this, um, this modification. But the clue to me is why didn't he see this? Why did the operator not actually see that the hose had actually um, you know, completely plunk in, that there was no airflow through there? So obviously continuous uh, monitoring the compressor is vital and you sh should never see a shop where the compressor is running you know, for several hours and they don't go out and check. They should be going out there every 30 minutes or so to make sure that they, you know, there are no oil spills. Um, just an amusing anecdote for you, I was doing a, a um, safety assessment at a dive operator in North Carolina and the compressors are outside, that's pretty normal, in a kind of a chain link fenced area with a, with a cover on, so nothing wrong with the compressor location. But the fellow was actually mowing the lawn and it was a gas powered um, lawn mower and he wheels it into the compressor area and puts it down the compressor area and you know what a lawn mower will smell like when it's hot. I could smell these vapors right near the intake to the compressor and when I asked him he said oh no no you've never had a problem with that before. Yeah. Air quality testing is a spot check. It means on the day mm -hmm. at that time that's the quality of the gas that is going into the cylinders. It's irrelevant in terms of the long-term possibilities of having a failure between air checks. But still we need to do it because it gives us at least some basis to work on. Usually we do it after a filter change telling us that the filter that we're putting in is actually you know, scrubbing out the, um, the contaminants that, that we're aware of that they can contaminate. So we have two diagnoses here, right? Carbon monoxide intoxication, but that's not the cause. That's a consequence. What's the real cause? I would say it's Dunning-Kruger syndrome, right? Overconfidence is people messing with things that they shouldn't be messing, the compressor. And I think this is my take in, in, in the diving environment, probably in many other environments too, there's a lot of people that have overconfidence in their skills and they think that because they've been doing this for a long time and they know how to deal with pressure and gases and hoses, they can do anything from extending hoses beyond what they should to actually operating a chamber. We see that all the time. Now, I've been a commercial diver for 50 years and I know how to deal with this. Right, you know how to man a chamber and bring it to pressure and, and then bring it down, but that's not it. It's, it's more than that, right? Okay, so also, to, you know, things change. People move things, parking lot can suddenly come in. The compressor room, because there's lots of space, becomes a storage room. There's paint stored in there. I've seen the whole range of stuff, and that's where the contaminants then come from. Yeah. Okay. So another case. This happened in East Africa around 2007. So this is uh, where Francois came from, and, and this was actually their case. So this was an, an, an unconscious patient is received for treatment in, in one of these uh, remote islands with a remote chamber. And it was late at night, and the, the only uh, staff for, for this chamber was actually the doctor. And the doctor is not necessarily the best operator, and many times probably shouldn't be the operator. But that was the only thing they had, so the operator was the doctor. And the doctor provided a long treatment uh, for, for this patient because of his condition, uh, and this treatment is supposed to have regular air breaks to you know, minimize the risk of oxygen toxicity during the treatment. And the patient wasn't responding at all. So that's when eventually they, uh, they called Dan. And when they called Dan, you know, starting asking questions, and the operator, the doctor, uh, admitted that he had some confusion with the, with the gauges and the, the controls on, on this chamber. Okay. So step number one, when you have somebody on their own inside the chamber and you have to give them air brakes, you have to strap the mask to their mm -hmm. head. That's the only way you're going to be able to you know, do this thing unmanned and clear. The doctor couldn't lock them, you know, himself into the chamber. So it is normal practice, there's nothing wrong with that, but to be able to give the person the air brake, you then need to have a control on the outside where you can change the, gas, the treatment gas from oxygen to air. And we see that pretty often on chambers, but it's not done for this purpose. It's done for, in the case of a fire, 
that from the outside you can switch the breathing gas from oxygen to air and prevent that um, additional accelerant from the fire from getting out of control. Okay, so we have a basic switch. Now, my background, this comes from doing military and commercial chambers. I did a lot of manufacture and, and design and that sort of stuff. I don't believe in what they were doing in these chambers where you have a single switch. Single switch is too easy to get wrong. And if the doctor is confused, then you can understand why. And actually, you call Dan, the patient expired, but we don't think it was as a result of this particular treatment. He'd been bent many times, local fisherman diver. But I got the call after he'd called Dan to say, what happens? You know, how could this be? And I know the chamber, so he started to ask me the positions of the different valves. So you're kind of getting the, the message now already. And I said to him, but that valve has a little label. It tells you which way is oxygen and which way is air. So he was confused as to whether he was giving the patient oxygen at one time and whether he was actually giving the patient air. Okay, so you've got a patient that's unstable, you're working on your own, you've got to operate the chamber, you've got to monitor the condition of the patient, very easy even for the best of us, including doctors, who actually get confused. And I didn't really appreciate the call at 2 o'clock in the morning, but hey, you know, you have to be able to help, because it, it essentially gave reason to why he wasn't responding. You know, clearly he wasn't getting what he should. So instead of the table six, if I can go to the next slide over here, instead of the green being given to him at those lengths of time, he basically had five minute oxygen breaks with 20 minute air breaks or air sessions. And clearly that's the reason why there was absolutely no uh, recovery in that. So essentially he continued diving, right? Just kept building up his um, nitrogen load. Okay, so just kind of the lessons we learn out of this. The first is you should never be operating a chamber alone. There should be proper planning in place to make sure that you, know, you have the staff that you require, that the communication systems work. On some of these islands, they you know renowned for losing cell phone signal, losing telephone signal. So the system needs to be set up that there are at least two people available near the chamber at all times if you're gonna offer these things 24 seven. Inadequate maintenance, one of the things we look out for, the labels fall off the valves, they should be stuck back in place. And when you do the pre-dive checklist, you'd be looking to make sure that that label's in place. And just, again, out of interest, we've got lots of things that we can track through in industry. I'm sure, just looking at the average age here, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard about Three Mile Island, the nuclear um, accident they had here in the States in the early 80s. Anybody? Okay. Analyzing that, because when I was studying, uh, studying nuclear engineering, we, could, you know, we get these case studies. And the long and short of it was, a label had fallen off a critical safety valve, the reactor scrambled for other reasons, they did what they thought was the right thing, and they were doing exactly the wrong thing, just because a label had fallen off. And we're talking of highly competent operators that have years and years of training. Um, just unfortunate, <clears throat> you know, and who do you blame? Well, you can start pointing fingers everywhere, but ultimately the people at the top are the ones that um, take the blame. Now, we don't have time because I want to share some other cases with you here, but in designing chambers, we don't do that. We don't have a single valve that you use in such a critical position. If we do, then we put a, an oxygen analyzer there that actually tells us continuously what the patient's actually breathing. So I disagree completely with the design, but these are typical deck decompression chamber type designs, as cheap as they can possibly do it, generally done by people that just think it's pipes and valves instead of thinking through what the issue is. Okay, so if the doctor is going to be operating the chamber, the doctor needs to be trained. And that doesn't mean an orientation, that means a thorough training. That means not only you know, where the valves are, but what basic maintenance needs to have been done, and they should be looking at those maintenance records and making sure that they follow the checklist. But again, you can think, you know, patient comes in very unstable, the doctor knows they're alone, and they, you know, all the kind of general orientation that they get in terms of training disappear at that particular stage. And the cardinal rule out of all of this is never treat the patient alone. Regardless of the criticality of it, you should never be doing something like that. Okay, especially if you're not a doctor, because we get you know, this happening with techs that think that they can actually take over. Yeah, yeah, we can't stress that enough. If you live in an area where there's a chamber, humble chamber, and, and they have a humble staff, if you know they're treating people without an inside tender, that's a big no-no, okay? Especially unstable patients. Yeah. 
So another, another interesting case. Uh, so somewhere in the Asia Pacific region in 2019. So this patient was breathing uh, on a mask, uh, through a mask on a, on a deep treatment. That's the type of mask you use in, in, in a regular diving chamber, right? This is what we call the Scots aviator's mask. Different to a clinical chamber where they tend to wear hoods here, or they're in a monoplace chamber which is 100% oxygen. This is typical for divers. You know, as divers, we used to have demand valves and exhaust valves. So divers don't tend to complain. Regular patients, you know, elderly folks with comorbidities, they don't like these masks. Now, so as divers, we're familiar with what we're seeing there, right? So a mask, a mouthpiece, in other words, and then we have one regulator on one side and, and something like a different regulator or a second regulator on the other side. So the difference here is on a diver, you breathe through a hose and then you exhale out to the ambient. Well, in the chamber, you don't want to do that because every exhalation contains much more oxygen than what you took for, for your needs. So if you exhale into the chamber, you will be contaminating the chamber with oxygen. And eventually, at some point, that atmosphere might become a fire hazard. So what we want to do is you breathe through a hose and then when you exhale, there's another regulator that is dumping your exhalation out of that chamber, not in the chamber. That's where you see two hoses and two type of regulators with a diaphragm out, like what we're used to. So this was a deep treatment table, uh, what we call a US Navy treatment table six, down to 165 feet of seawater. So when you're that deep, you're usually not breathing air because otherwise you would be, the tender would be under narcosis and, and, and you cannot be breathing oxygen too because it's toxic at that depth. So usually what they do, one of the modifications for this treatment table is to have the patient breathe uh, nitrox. In this case was a 50-15 uh, mix, but it could be 40-60. And so at some point during the treatment, the, the mask exhaust regulator failed. And if you think that this is dumping air out, so if it failed and it failed open, essentially this diver's face was exposed to one atmosphere when he was at six. So like a big, big hickey, right? That's a very uh, strong suction power. So just if I can kind of give you some magnitude on that, you go to outer space in a space shuttle, okay? If you develop a hole in the size of the space shuttle, you're not going to stick your finger on there, are you? And that's only a one atmosphere pressure difference between the inside of the space shuttle and vacuum on the outside. We have six times that force. Really, really difficult to, to explain how strong that force is. So yeah. surprisingly, he survived, but that was because the tent on the inside managed to get it off his face. That's one of the many reasons you do want a tender in that chamber, right? So what the chamber, the tender did was remove the face from the mask, uh, the, the mask from the face, and, and rescued this, this uh, tender, this diver. Well, nevertheless, of course, he had significant hematoma uh, uh, on, the, on his face, uh, but he, this recovered over time. Okay, what this really comes down to um, is lack of knowledge or probably what happened is the chamber was designed for one thing and then because it could handle six atmospheres the staff decided to take a chance and do a very deep uh, treatment and from the medical side engineering it's fine from the medical side we don't like these deep treatments they are prone to problems if things go wrong then they can go seriously wrong but in this particular case what happened was that they didn't have some means of actually stopping it, that sort of vacuum. We put up what we call a vacuum breaker or back pressure regulator that ensures that you can never have this amount of suction on the patient. There's always a, a limited amount of suction, just enough to suck out that oxygen and dump it on the outside. The second part of this is they didn't do, they, it often happens, you know, we, we try and teach people the basics of maintenance, meaning what the operators should be doing, not what the maintenance techs need to do. And you know, those of us that have taken regulators apart, none of these things are, are foreign to us. But there's a rubber diaphragm on the inside, and rubber diaphragms can crack and can leak. Okay, and if you get a leak in the diaphragm, it's simply not going to actually uh, shut off correctly. Okay, so we have a major suction injury in this particular case. The the mask that Matthias showed you, the, what we call the Scott Aviator mask, is designed to be fail-safe, up to 66 feet of seawater. 
And if you read the instructions to those masks, they say no deeper than 66 feet of seawater. But you know, they kind of work, so people you know, end up doing a, what they call a comix, 50-50 treatment to 100 feet of seawater, and they get you know, kind of uh, pretty complacent, not understanding what, what the risks are, what they should be doing. And so when you go above 66 feet, and we're talking about 165 feet, with a slight tear in the diaphragm, it just failed open. And the first stage, obviously then, was meant to continue to flow air in there, and the first stage failed too, because the suction force was just too much. So no alleviation coming in, and just suction going out on the outside. Okay, so we have what we call the secondary protection. In some countries, they use a vacuum breaker, as you'd have on your hot water heater. If there's any negative pressure, it just simply opens the vacuum breaker. But in things flashing I don't know. Here, these apples. You know, We're not even touching it. I'm not doing anything. No, that's fine. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm going to come back to this one in a moment. Let me just... You have to pa pardon me. When we've got animations and it's an apple, I don't always get myself um, correct over here. So... We put this, as we call this, back pressure regulator in place. It's the fail-safe device. That's really what is there to protect this from, from happening. There are a couple of complications. One of them is they cost about seven grand, and people don't want to do that. But a properly designed chamber that is using face masks should always have a back pressure regulator in there if it's ever capable of going above 66 feet. So when we go and look at these chambers and we see they're 165 feet seawater, and they tell us they never go beyond 66 feet. Let me tell you that they will admit to me that sometimes they're not paying attention. The next thing they look, and the chamber's sitting at 80 feet or 90 feet of seawater. And the patients are breathing oxygen. So never mind toxicity issues, we're putting those um, breathing masks under a lot of strain. And the, again, trying to get this information was tough because it was kind of a hospital issue. They were concerned about liability issues, but ultimately, we also got some pictures, which we can't share with you, because we were told not for public consumption, but you can see the hematoma, very, very uh, dramatic hematoma. Yeah, so one of the many reasons we don't encourage people to use those treatment tables is not that the tables are not good, uh, it's that for, for people to be able to use them and use them safely, they need to know what they're doing. This is just one of the many risks you're facing when you're trying to run a treatment table with, with a setting that was not designed for, for that. For another case, this was in somewhere. Hit it. Yeah. No, nothing else, just a hematoma on his face, yeah. But he was lucky because actually yeah. at that pressure it should have taken his lungs out. So I'm, I'm not, you know, we don't always know all the details, we just know that that's what happened. Um, where that happened at 165 or you know, maybe closer to the surface, I'm, we don't really know. There's a really graphic case of extreme suction at yeah. uh, about 500 feet, 400 feet of seawater when the commercial diver was sitting on the toilet. Engineering-wise, again, I don't get it because when we design these things, there are all sorts of controls, fail-safe controls, but he was basically exposed to 400 feet of vacuum and it took out two-thirds of his intestine. He survived had to fly a doctor in, put him in saturation, do a resection, and you know, hold his hand as he came out of decompression. But um, that's, you know, as you say, lung, the, I would expect the lungs to have, um, to have been damaged. Maybe the, I don't know, Matthias, maybe the throat closes under Yeah, I mean, many things can go wrong, but he was lucky, yeah. Interesting case, this one. So, Mediterranean, 2014. So, in this case, there was a group of 11 divers. And out of those 11 divers, uh, there were three fatalities and, and one survivor. So among the fatalities or the injured people, the depths that they were exposed to were uh, 35 meters or 114 feet uh, for two of the deceased divers. And one deceased diver and the survivor were exposed to 130 feet. So on ascent, when they were reaching about 25 meters of seawater, about 50 feet, and two were rescued in water, and two were non-responsive on, on surface. Um, three perished despite the CPR efforts, and, and like I said, only one survived. Okay, so this is, this is really pretty extreme, and this was, in a court case, I was called in as the expert witness, I never called myself an expert, but so I could actually watch how this thing evolved, and you don't get all the information up front, and then eventually the information is drawn out by the investigators. And there are about four or 500 pages of documents, and I don't really read Italian. 
And I couldn't just put it into Google Translate because they were scans of scans. Anyway, what they, the conclusion they drew, although not 100% confirmed because they didn't take blood gas afterwards, they just assumed because of the symptoms that, that the, um, some of the indications are going to share with you that it was carbon monoxide poisoning. The dive boat cylinders were filled on the, on the dive boat. They had two gas-powered compressors on the back. So kind of the warning bells are already starting to, uh, to go off here. They recovered, it was a whole batch of cylinders. I forget whether there were 30 cylinders or something in that range. And they then analyzed them, and it ranged from 7.5 ppm, which is already above the European limit, to 2,405 parts per million carbon monoxide. I mean, this is like, it should be instant death. <laughs> and I want you to explain in a moment why um, sometimes people survive. Interesting, those are the levels, those are, they took the cylinders from the people that actually uh, perished. And you can see the levels are ridiculous. Okay, what's really interesting is diver number four had the greatest load of carbon monoxide, and yet she actually survived the dive. And remember your surface equivalent value. So we're getting 1.45 to 1.5 times the number of um, oxygen, uh, carbon monoxide molecules that they're breathing in. They then went to the compressor and they did a bunch of tests on the compressor. The operator swore blind that they followed all the rules that they should have followed. And they got between you know, 3.3 to, to 18 parts per million um, of carbon monoxide running the compressor about three weeks or six weeks later after they'd done the investigation. Okay, so why do we have this carbon monoxide in here? You know, most dive operators are pretty aware of the fact that gas contamination on a boat where you have diesel engines running on the boat and gas-powered compressors, you'd think that they'd actually know what it is they're doing. So they took the intakes for the compressors and put them under the canopy. That's a boat with a, um, not a great picture, but a canopy at the back where the divers can actually see, sit, and they had the hoses actually plugged in there. But can you already see where we're going with all of this? Having a canopy, which is a, an enclosed space, hot gas can actually sit underneath there and actually exacerbate the problem. Probably best if they trailed the hoses down somewhere mm -hmm. near the water. It was reported that the diesel engines of the boat were running. So, you know, firstly they thought about the, the, um, the compressors, that there was something wrong with the compressors, and then they heard that the, the, boats were actually, the boat was actually running. That's a no-no when you're filling cylinders on a boat. The, you know, as I said, I was asked to be the expert witness, and that amount of carbon monoxide is unbelievable. I mean, you really shouldn't be getting those sort of levels, never mind oil burning. And the oil was fine, by the way. There was no indication of burning oil in this. And when I was looking at, I don't know if there are any smokers here, don't identify yourselves, <laughs> but a, a puff of the cigarette gives you about 800 parts per million. I mean, it's hugely diluted, and you obviously exhaling and breathing in clean air in the process too. But that wasn't high enough to get to this level. If you smoke a cigar, then you get up to what these levels are. But of course, the operator said, I never smoke when I'm filling the compressor. And I can't say he did or didn't, because that you know, is not necessarily the only cause. But of course, everybody you know, pleads innocence when these things come out. But here is one of the key issues to the, to the problem solving. And that was the fact that this dive operator, to save money, used to fill his own um, filter cartridges. And I'll come back to where the key in that actually We've is. We've never seen that, right? <laughs> so, the first time he refilled them, he took the filter cartridge, I'll show you a picture in a moment, and emptied everything out and saw there was black stuff and there was kind of this fawny colored little uh, uh, um, beads, which is molecular sieve. So of course he thought, Activated carbon, molecular sieve, that's all I need to have. And a lot of compressive uh, car filter cartridges, that's exactly what you get in there, just two different chemicals. It's not, it's three chemicals. And because the black is black, although one is slightly brown, um, the one is actually a carbon monoxide catalyst. It's there to actually remove the carbon monoxide, and clearly they didn't. They analyzed these things afterwards. Just a note that... We can tolerate about 60 parts per million of carbon monoxide without any short-term issues. Obviously, long-term um, issues are a problem. And you, what you probably don't know is that your carbon monoxide alarm in your house has about a 10-minute response time at times, and it only triggers off at about 100 to 120 parts per million. So that, by the time your alarm goes off in the house, you've got a serious problem. But we can survive that sort of level. At 400 parts per million at the surface, so no surface equivalent value, you'd expect a person to have a major reaction to that. 
In this particular case, with the surface equivalent value, these people were breathing between eight and 9,000 parts per million of carbon monoxide. It defies comprehension. And give us a clue as to how this could actually, um, how they could have survived for so long. Well, the easy answer is this proves two things, right? One, God exists, and two, he dives in the Mediterranean. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. When you consider that carbon monoxide is, depending on, depending on literature you read, uh, or more than a hundred times more affinity to hemoglobin than, than oxygen. So when you have, say, one particle and 300 particles of, of oxygen, they have about equal chances of binding to hemoglobin. So when you're exposed to this amount of, of particles per volume, right, in, 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 in the air you breathe, it's mind-blowing that actually one survived and the rest didn't seem to have any symptoms, right? But explain to them what happens when you dive now. Well, so when you're diving, you're having all this in a much larger concentration, in a much, much, this is much more affinity, much more, there's less competition with, with, between the oxygen molecules and the carbon monoxide molecules. So it, it grows, the risk grows exponentially. But at the same time in the air, there's still oxygen in the air. And right. And we're dissolving that oxygen into the blood like we dissolve nitrogen. So the hemoglobin has a lesser effect because we have dissolved oxygen. So on the way down, and at depth, we've got elevated yeah. amounts of dissolved oxygen. So the, you can actually survive for quite a long time at these elevated levels. Yeah, so that's what you mean, yeah. yeah. And, but on the way back up to the surface, the oxygen disappears and the hemoglobin becomes the carrier, and that's why in this particular case, they got to 25 me uh, meters, 75 feet, how they survived at 35 mm. to 40 is still, I don't understand, pretty tough. Yeah, it's this competitive reaction. You have more of the bad thing, but you also have more of the good thing. So it kind of dilutes, that's what yeah. you meant. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you would not be able to survive that partial pressure with a normoxic environment, right? But on the way to the surface, the O2 then disappears, the carbon monoxide overwhelms, the, the hemoglobin is the carrier, and that's why they pass out on the way up to the surface. It's, it's pretty common we see that in carbon monoxide poisoning. Now here's part of what we try to do to prevent this from actually happening. So that's what Hopkalite, it's, a, it's a basically a chemical that is used as a catalyst, meaning that it lasts indefinitely because it does a, a reaction, but it doesn't get consumed in the reaction. So pretty robust stuff. And what it does is it takes two carbon monoxide molecules, okay, together with oxygen that's coming through the filter, and it converts it to two parts of carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide levels will go up, um, and the carbon monoxide levels will actually then come down. But it has a limit, and the limit to get zero carbon monoxide coming out is about 100 ppm. So if you put 100 parts per million in, you will get zero carbon monoxide coming out. So it's a fail-safe for what we would call incidental carbon monoxide in the atmosphere. It's not going to help you when you get to these, these hideous levels. So that's what a, what a filter cartridge usually looks like. And I don't have a pointer here to show you. But the brownish stuff is molecular sieve. That removes the moisture. And it actually does remove some of the carbon dioxide in the gas coming out of the compressor. Then the next one, the next black layer, that is the hopkalite. Okay, so that's there to remove the carbon monoxide. That's all it does. And then the second band of black is the activated carbon. And that removes the odor and any amount of oil that is left actually in the breathing air. And the white lines are just um, felt sieves, if you want to call them that, to prevent the dust from the molecular sieve and the other chemicals from getting through. And in this particular case, this is a, this is a great filter cartridge to show you because it's one manufacturer in the US and they're using the acrylic pipe to put the um, um, chemicals in. The compressors they were using have this kind of metal pipe that they put in aluminium, almost like a foil. So he couldn't see that there were different levels inside there. Okay, so what, we, what the take home from this is, firstly, if you're going to be using your own filter media by a big bag or a big drum of molecular sieve and packets of activated carbon and hopcolite, you can, you can recapture your hopcolite and reuse it. But generally, it's not expensive, and we would just then pack this thing with three different chemicals. But you need to be highly trained, and the boat owner, the dive operator, needs to make sure that their staff are trained and competent. And the staff are not telling the dive owner, we know what it is. I've been doing this for many, many, many years, and um, nothing's happened before. I can save you money if we buy the different things, and I can put them together myself, right? There's another snag with that at the moment. You open the drum of molecular sieve, it starts to absorb moisture in the environment, and it actually loses its uh, latency. 
Obviously, the compressor intake positions need to be very, very carefully placed. So as, a, as I said to you, probably best if they drew in the gas from down the back of the boat than anywhere near up in the canopy. Um, clearly, boat engines are meant to be switched off. These are golden rules that people are obviously not, not uh, following. And then again, I would not again add on to that, you should check the wind direction. So wherever the wind is blowing from, make sure that you put your intakes upstream, not downstream where it can actually accumulate. And obviously past where the compressor is. Clearly no smoking during operation. It does, it's a great source of carbon monoxide. And again, our levels are small. We allow five parts per million in Europe and 10 parts per million here in the US. Um, which are very low levels. And if you have 800 coming out of a regular cigarette, you can see how quickly we can end up with a problem. And lastly, in this particular case, they should, if you're using a gas-powered compressor on a boat, regular carbon monoxide monitoring is a requirement. A carbon monoxide monitor, you use it on your um, cylinder, is about 90 bucks. They've got some really great ones available now, very robust ones. And you put it, push it against the, the, the cylinder, crack some gas through, and it'll tell you immediately whether there's carbon monoxide. So we're not talking about an expensive device. And obviously then make sure that you do things very strictly. You have a checklist. If you're on a boat with a diesel engine, check off all the things you shouldn't be doing before you actually then fill the cylinders. But it's a very interesting case to see the amount of carbon monoxide that these divers could actually inhale and survive for that length of time underwater. Any questions on that one? So there's jail time in this particular case and a lot of money that had to go back to the victims' families. Yeah. And again, the same thing, right? Dining Kruger. Overconfidence and just paying a high price. Anybody here from the West Coast? So what does the West Coast, Coast go through frequently, almost every year now? Earthquakes and? Fires. So we got a bunch of calls on the on the hotline about the fires, and um, I spoke to personally spoke to some of the people that got passed on to me. And the question was, we got all these fires. I can smell the smoke. Is you know, is there a chance that my tank can contain carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and a bunch of other stuff? So I, I can't answer the question. And I really need to know: Does the compressor have a hop collide to carbon monoxide trap to actually remove the carbon monoxide? So a colleague and I jumped on a plane rented a car and drove from San, San Diego all the way up to, to Oregon to go and have a look and see what we could, and we were fire chasing. we go from dive center to dive center in the areas where there were big fires to see what, uh, what the problem was. Now when we have these forest fires, most of the smoke is going to come from burning vegetation. So it's going to be carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and particulates. And out of all of those three, it's the particulates that have the biggest impact unless you're standing right where the fire is. By the time you smell the smoke, that's particulate matter. And the air quality index that the EPA manage has a particular part of it, a very, very high component, is particulates 2.5 microns and 10 microns. So if you can smell it, it indicates the particulates in the environment. And one particular town that we were doing the measurements at, um, I couldn't stand outside for more than 10 minutes. I was trying to monitor the gas, and it was that's how much it was. But the short end of all of this is we went to about 18 different dive centers, zero carbon monoxide, totally normal carbon dioxide, and no smoke particles. And as I said to them, you're not going to run the compressor when your town is burning, right? <laughs> when there's smoke in the area. But your filter, if you use the right filters, it's going to make sure that your, that your gas is going to be safe. So it was pretty interesting. I thought if any of you go diving in Catalina or any of those places and you can smell the smoke, is that going to be an issue for you? And again, this is the interaction between medicine and engineering, how we get to solve a lot of these issues. Oh, we try to. <laughs> Any questions? Any other questions? Any clue or all? Why they survived? What the last victim survived? Why they survived? I don't think there's, I don't have a good one, but... Who knows? I mean, some people, you know, sometimes you see people in a clinical setting with uh, serious symptoms and relatively low carboxyhemoglobin levels. And some others, they have really high carboxyhemoglobin levels that are tested because they were, they coexisted in the same incident. And they either don't experience the same degree of, of symptoms or they don't develop any symptoms at all. 
That's why the indication is sometimes not just based on carboxyhemoglobin levels, but on symptoms. It's either a level that is too high despite the symptoms, or symptoms regardless of the level. Or different people will react different ways. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention.